Yes? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, welcome to the second uh, session of the EY's History of Science and Medicine Working Group series on the History of the Human Mind. Uh, in this series, um, we aim to explore different perceptions of the human mind in four different historical frameworks. Uh, we'll try to make sense of the human mind in many different ways and approach it from many different angles throughout history. Um, and by taking a closer look at four of these approaches, we aim to shed some light on the diversity in this historical topic. Um, in January, Luana Salvarami told us about the human mind in relation to the brain in the context of Galenism and Renaissance politics. Uh, and today, Professor Mattia della Rocca uh, from the Università di Roma Don Pegata will focus on the late 20th century, so it's something entirely different, um, yet related. Uh, and we're very glad to have you at UI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mattia della Rocca did his PhD in History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pisa and now works at the Università di Roma Don Pegata. Um, teaching a lot of courses in psychology as well, as you just told us. Um, he's interested in the relationship between science and society, with a particular focus on psychology, cognitive science, and neurosciences. Um, and he has been doing research on conceptualization of so the natural and digital environment uh, in recent years. And today we'll talk about um, embodied cognition and the so called inactive term through an analysis of Gibson's ecological approach to visual perception from 1979. Psychiatrist uh, that he shared with us earlier, and uh, that some of you have finally been able to take a look at. Um, after this session, Noga Arika will talk about Franz Boas between psychology and anthropology on the 1st of March, and uh, Guido Giglioni will talk about um, how to be suspicious of one's own mind situated that between Bacon and Locke on the 8th of March. So that's next month, just so you know. Um, in, uh, Late April or early May, we'll try to organize a return session and talk about all the insights that we've gathered from all these uh, wonderful scholars and um, have a discussion on that here at EY. More news on that later. Because for now, it's time for Mattia de la Roca's talk. Uh, the talk will be between 20 and 30 minutes long. Um, don't worry if you take a bit longer, the, it's, uh, uh, we have the time. Um, but after that, we have roughly one hour for questions and, uh, and discussion. Uh, Mattia, thank you again very much for being uh, with us here today, and um, the floor is yours, we're looking forward. Thank you, Timo, thank you, Matsim, and thank you all uh, for the invitation uh, to this uh, great uh, series of uh, seminars and uh, reading, and uh, thank you also for uh, your presentation. So, uh, today we're going to uh, read together uh, some uh, of the most important papers, in my personal opinion, some of the most important pages, sorry. Uh, in the history of contemporary psychology and uh, we're going to focus on uh, the most important work of uh, James Jerome Gibson uh, whose uh, research has uh, deeply, deeply shaped uh, the way we think about perception and uh, in the end, uh, uh, it, uh, this is uh, what I'm going to try to, to highlight, to, 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 to comment with you today uh, also, the contemporary theoretical framework uh, in which we explore human cognition and also the study of the nervous system now in the 21st century. Uh, I try to remain my time, so let me start immediately with a, an outline of uh, this uh, uh, little talk. I will try to provide a historical contextualization of Gibson's life and work, uh, especially underlining what kind of influences he received during the year of his uh, early education and uh, uh, during the first appointments as a scholar and researcher in some of the uh, uh, most important American institutions. Um, then we'll try to move uh, to uh, the very core of, uh, uh, this, uh, of this uh, seminar that uh, is exactly a historical epistemological reading on uh, these uh, uh, excerpts that I have selected uh, together with uh, Tim Juan Maxim when they proposed me to be here from uh, the last book by James Gibson, that is the ecological approach to visual perception issued in 1979. Uh, the very uh, year of his death, uh, and uh, and then I will also, as I was saying before, off the record, uh, I will uh, exploit your patience and your attention because, uh, uh, as the title of this uh, talk suggests, what is alive and what is dead in the ecological theory of perception, this entails that uh, 
there is perspective from which we can consider that something is alive or dead. And uh, this perspective is uh, the, um, the theoretical uh, partial conclusion is a work in progress of my own research about the concept of environment. So I, I apologize, but for boring you to death with these considerations. So, uh, as I was saying uh, uh, to you, uh, this uh, is the book we're going to discuss. The ecological approach to visual perception is something that you can find almost uh, in an ubiquitary way in every single textbook of general psychology or, more accurately, in uh, perceptology. Uh, every single study that uh, has to do with the way we perceive the world uh, has to take into account the theory by Jerome, James Jerome Gibson. Uh, the first uh, edition uh, was, uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, can be dated back to 1979. I have selected a print uh, from Taylor Francis, an edition from uh, 2015, uh, that contains uh, uh, even a short introduction by Mace, some foreword by Mace, added uh, to the origin of the so called classic of edition. Uh, let me spend a few words about uh, James Jerome Gibson. Um, as I was saying uh, before, he uh, has to be considered one of the most prominent figures of uh, American psychology, even if a lot of uh, historians uh, have found some uh, difficulties in uh, framing him into one of the mainstream, quote-unquote, schools of psychology that uh, we usually associate with uh, 21st century uh, in the United States, namely functionalism uh, by William James and colleagues, behaviorism by Watson and Skinner, and cognitivism. This is uh, because uh, James Jerome Gibson uh, has had uh, the opportunity just to undergo through different moments of the, the history of the discipline in the United States and uh, as I will try to show you uh, to show you this is something that uh, uh, has also to do with uh, his mentors and uh, some uh, other important names in the history of psychology that uh, for several reasons uh, found themselves uh, the same, uh, sharing the same uh, institutions the same uh, conceptual space of debate and uh, uh, these kind of influences and of course also Gibson's uh, own original uh, reflection uh, has uh, completely changed the way we think about perception. Uh, this is uh, also something that is usually related to the so-called ecological term in psychology that is usually uh, considered a moment uh, uh, starting in uh, the 70s when uh, psychologists started to uh, feel uh, uh, very disappointed by uh, some of the most rigid tenets of cognitivism uh, as well as they have been in respect to behaviorism. And uh, I also want to uh, remember that uh, uh, Gibson's legacy is uh, today considered uh, the cornerstone for several branches of investigation into psychological sciences, uh, namely ecological psychology and environmental psychology. But I guess that we have to remember that there is something more uh, when we think about uh, perception, when we study perception, even during our first years of higher education, we learn that uh, there are mainly two models. The under model of perception, that is usually uh, traced back to the work of Gregory, that uh, says in a very constructivist way that we have to create some inferences and representation within our mind in order to understand in order to perceive what is in the physical environment. So uh, it's not enough that I just look at the people's space in order to make a perception of this space. I have to have a sort of schema in my mind, a sort of uh, mental representation that just helps me to create a natural perception of people's space. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we got the Gibson theory of direct perception. According to this theory, perception is a direct process. What uh, uh, is meant uh, with this adjective, direct, 
First, sensation is sufficient for leading to perceptual processes. Everything that I need in order to create a perception is already in the environment and I don't have to postulate other mental artifacts in order to perceive the world. At the same time, this means that perception is innate and immediate. It cannot be learned and, above all, it, as it is not mediated by any mental state or any phenomenal state. I just uh, want to underline this because, as uh, you will see, this is a major point of my argument uh, in favor and against uh, Gibson's theory. Finally, uh, this is uh, something that is very trivial, I apologize for repeating this, but uh, I want to make it clear that uh, perception, as it was formulated by Gibson, uh, is uh, something that uh, just states the bottom-up quality of perception. We just need the basic elements of sensations in the environment and uh, it is completely data-driven, meaning that uh, all the information that we can retrieve from the environment with the direct and simple act of looking, uh, in, uh, in the case of sight, of course, but you can just extend this discourse to any sensory organ. The characteristics, the features of the elements in the environment are enough to orient and direct this kind of processes. This is extremely relevant if you think about the contemporary framework in which we find ourselves thinking about the mind, studying the mind. Today we talk, uh, we call this uh, theoretical uh, framework uh, as the four E's framework for the study of cognition, even if, uh, as you probably know, also neuroscience, not just cognitive scientists or, or psychologists, uh, adopt this kind of expression. What are these four E's? The first one is the E of embodiment. Every cognition has to be considered as something that has directly to do with our face physiology, therefore with, our, with some characteristics that are species-specific. In other words, if uh, I can be uh, the boring uh, historical science that I am at uh, the core of my soul, think of Anasagora when uh, he told that uh, against uh, Aristotle's position, okay, it wasn't a direct confrontation, but uh, usually uh, it's presented this way, and when Anasagora say that we think this way because we have such a hand, okay, against the teleology represented usually by Aristotle. So, a cognition always shares the peculiarity of the physiology of the organism who births this cognition, who enacts this cognition, and is thinking about an action. This is the second E, and uh, this is uh, especially important in respect to Gibson's work, because uh, Gibson is usually considered the founding father of the enactive approach. What is enactivism? Is the idea that we shouldn't divide, uh, not even for didactic sake, the idea that perception and action are separate entities or separate processes. So when I take a look at an object, uh, think about this plastic bottle in front, of, in front of me, I do not have to think about what kind of action I can, uh, I can apply to this object. I already know by simple perceiving it, perceiving it that I can take it this way with a strong grasp. I'll get back to this example later. Then we have an embedment, and uh, this also is peculiar, particularly important. Why? Because uh, every single act of cognition, including perception, always takes place into a context, into an environment, is embedded into a context. While, again, I'm so sorry, this can sound very trivial, but uh, just imagine, guys, that uh, in fact uh, this was a major breakthrough when confronted to the fact that for, that for uh, 400 years we just uh, uh, were slave of the uh, uh, methodological individualism that uh, is a direct legacy of uh, the car thinking. Finally, the last E is, uh, extend, stands for extended cognition. Uh, what is extended cognition? There are many ways of uh, uh, speaking about the extension of our cognition in the world. Probably you will be used uh, uh, 
uh, to the arguments made by Clark and Schauers about the fact that if I have a notebook, I am just extending my memory by using a tool, by using an external tool, I personally think that we should uh, intend, we should mean an extended cognition as something more, uh, because it has to do also, in my opinion, I will try to make this point later with you, uh, this is something that also has to do with the concretion of uh, some cognitive artifacts in the environment. Think about, for example, uh, ideological representation that we have uh, in the cultural symbolic and social environment, but I will get uh, back to this later. Now, uh, since uh, time is a tyrant, uh, let me have a, a very quick overview about some uh, uh, of the most important moments of Gibson's education. He enrolled into a university, the Northwestern University, in 1921, but he, after his uh, freshman year he moved to Princeton, and, uh, where he earned uh, uh, all his degrees, his Bachelor of Arts, his Master of Arts, and during uh, his senior year he met uh, two important figures, Edmund B. Oat and Herbert Langfield. Herbert Langfield especially teaching experimental psychology classes. After this meeting, Gibson decided to pursue a graduate career in psychology, graduating in 1928. So, uh, why these uh, two people are so important in Gibson's education? Um, about Edwin Old, uh, we have to remember that he was considered one of the founders of the so-called New Realism. Uh, we will see in a while what uh, this uh, implies. Uh, I just want to remember that uh, as a philosopher, uh, Old uh, was uh, one of the most influential American philosophers of the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century and uh, his uh, thinking uh, influenced also other important figures in the history of psychology including Edward Tolman, one of the scholars responsible for the, uh, the final uh, fall and decline of behaviorism in the United States. On the other hand, we have Herbert Langfield, again, both philosopher and psychologist. He was particularly interested in aesthetics, in a so-called functional value of the images. This is a key word that will uh, appear again in, uh, uh, in Gibson's work. And uh, one of the last uh, American uh, scholars uh, to have uh, spent uh, the, his uh, education years in Europe. He uh, earned his uh, doctorate uh, under the supervision of Stumpf in 1909. Uh, these uh, two uh, figures, both very, very dissatisfied with behaviorism, uh, gave uh, Gibson uh, some uh, dramatic influences that uh, would, uh, would have shaped the, uh, his thinking uh, all for all through his life. So from Holt, uh, uh, Gibson took uh, a, a taste for radical empiricism. What is this uh, uh, philosophical position, epistemic position? Uh, according to radical empiricism, both the behavior and the nervous system just reflect the regularities that already exist in the environment. This is uh, extremely important because, as you will see, these uh, will be the core of the theory of direct perception. The idea that everything that is needed in order to perceive something already exists in the environment and that your behavior, your cognition, even if uh, this is an antiliteral use of the term, since in the theory this no cognition was allowed in the psychological lingo because of the uh, dogma of behaviorism. Uh, this is particularly important because cognition means that uh, you don't have to think more about the things that you have that surround you. Uh, everything that is available already represents cognition itself, and this matches perfectly with uh, the legacy from by Landfield in Gibson. Langfield uh, is uh, considered one of the most important uh, figures uh, in uh, the so-called operationist movement. Uh, for those of you, uh, I guess that uh, the vast majority of, of us knows about 
uh, operations, but uh, just to make it clear, uh, this is uh, the uh, so-called uh, leap of faith of uh, any uh, psychologist in the world. Uh, psychology has to deal with uh, uh, subjects, uh, topics of uh, investigation that are completely no, insane. Uh, I, when, uh, what does it mean to study love? What does it mean to study romantic attraction? What does it mean to study memory? Every time I have to study this kind of constructs, I have to operationalize them. Okay, I have to make a set of operations. I have to define a set of operations that can describe a concept, that can describe a construct. But operationist brings this perspective uh, to the uh, to its uh, intrinsic consequence, intrinsic consequence that is I don't need any other description of something uh, uh, but the set of operation. So what is memory is my ability to recall a set of symbols, nothing more. Every other definition is something that uh, will be perceived as metaphysical and you know that American pragmatism usually has a very dislike metaphysical description. Uh, but uh, this is not uh, uh, the, only, uh, the only influences that uh, Gibson uh, uh, received during the, the, the first years of his career as a, a PhD in psychology. We have to move uh, uh, at, the, at the end of the same year he graduated from Princeton when he moved to Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, where in 1927, a year before, Kurt Kofka arrived uh, fleeing, uh, from uh, Germany, from Nazi Germany. Kurt, Kurt Kofka is one of the founding fathers of uh, Gestalt psychology, together with uh, Bert Timer and Keller. And uh, as you probably know, Keller was the only one of the original Gestaltist group to be, to be Christian, while uh, Bert Timer, Kofka, Levin, Heider, they were all uh, a member of the Jewish community, so they had to flee uh, Germany and find shelter in the United States. Uh, Gestaltist legacy in the United States is always a very complicated uh, matter because, uh, in fact, uh, again, uh, because of American pragmatism, American scholars just said, uh, so you're studying what? Visual illusions? Whoa, we don't care about this. This wasn't, some, this wasn't the fate for everybody. Kurt Levin, for example, having the ability to apply the concept of Gansfeld and the concept of uh, field to the social field received, uh, he gained uh, an enormous momentum in the United States. Um, for Kafka, Keller and Bertheimer, the situation was not so uh, easy busy, but notwithstanding this, Kafka had the opportunity to be appointed as one of the psychology professors at Smith College. And uh, we will get back to uh, the legacy of Kafka uh, because it's particularly re relevant for understanding Gibson. But I want to underline something that is uh, less known uh, also from a historical point of view. Uh, in Northampton, in, uh, at the Smith College, also another scholar from the Gestalt School uh, was uh, present, and I'm uh, referring to Fritz Eiler, uh, that uh, was a uh, uh, guy who uh, studied for a very long time attribution in, uh, in psychology, but uh, uh, not just this. What are the most important uh, uh, parts of the Gestalt legacy that Kafka and Eiger brought in the United States. Kafka uh, was uh, responsible for the spreading of this concept, the behavioral environment, the idea that there is a distinction between the physical environment and the environment that is perceived from a phenomenal perspective by the organism itself. Either, on the other hand, uh, he didn't work just on uh, attribution of causality and uh, uh, motivation of organism, but uh, he was also the guy making the distinction between uh, distal and proximal stimuli, and therefore the amount of uh, information contained uh, in the environment when we sense it with, uh, via our sensory organs and uh, the 
actual amount of information, the actual range of information that we can process. Just to make the example, I, as you know, we cannot uh, catch all of the optic gamma, we can just uh, have uh, uh, a minimum part, a minimum part of, of this that is uh, something that is allowed exactly by our sensory organs and this is the difference between distal and proximal stimuli. Uh, you will see that this is something that will get uh, back uh, constantly in uh, the work of Gibson. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, if I am uh, uh, in time, I try to run a little bit. Uh, <coughs> so uh, now I uh, will get back to the text in order to highlight what are the most important parts of it uh, in, my, in my personal view. And I would like to start, since this uh, uh, talk uh, has, uh, has a title, Environment and Information, exactly from the definition of environment that uh, Gibson provides to his reader in this uh, 1979 book. Uh, this is from page 3, and uh, what uh, Gibson writes, environment will refer to the surroundings of those organisms uh, the way he perceives, it perceives and behaves the surrounding. I always uh, thought that uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of definition, uh, yes, while it is very clear and uh, very consistent with the tradition, just uh, just doesn't go over the mere etymology. Uh, environment comes from the French on the home meaning the surrounding, and uh, also the, the Italian word for it, ambiente, comes from um, the Latin ambience, meaning what is around the subject. So, yes, the environment is the surroundings of the audience, and that's quite clear, but maybe also a little bit trivial. Uh, more interesting, in my opinion, is the fact that uh, Gibson uh, operates a very uh, rigid uh, distinction between uh, the world of animals, but not, but it doesn't include uh, plants or other living beings within uh, this uh, animated environment that is at the, the, the core of uh, his uh, of his research. I uh, personally uh, think that this is uh, uh, a point uh, that we can criticize. Maybe I'll, I will have the time to do so later, uh, but. Uh, after uh, just a, a page later, uh, something interesting appears. This is something that uh, was stated for the first time in, uh, uh, in Gibson's work, uh, actually also in the 1966 uh, book uh, about the direct uh, perception theory. Uh, Gibson already made this point, but uh, in the 1979 book uh, he made it completely, completely clear. Environments cannot exist without organisms, just like organisms cannot exist without uh, environments. Uh, notwithstanding the fact uh, he wrote that we use different words for referring to these two uh, entities in philosophical terms, uh, an environment always implies an animal, and uh, an animal is always the real bearer of construction of sea of meaning of the environment itself. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, moves uh, Gibson away from their physicalism, uh, but what is more important is how he continues this uh, sentence by stating that every animal is, in some degree at least, a perceiver hand up here. It is sanctioned and animated to use old-fashioned terms, you can see here how much he dislikes. Uh, metaf any metaphysical approach coming from, uh, from European analysis. It is a procedure of the environment and a behavior in the environment. I know that these sentences can suggest that in fact there is a sort of distinction uh, or a separate uh, uh, moment uh, in the causality of these processes, but uh, I, will, uh, I will show you how this uh, is uh, something that uh, he that uh, Gibson himself will deny in a few pages. But uh, now I have to take another digression because this is important, uh, I mean, of the paramount importance. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that we usually associate um, an activism in, uh, to these uh, words of, uh, by Gibson that we have just read, 
this wasn't uh, actually a new uh, concept in uh, biological sciences and uh, to a lesser extent also in psychological science because uh, somebody else uh, had described this kind of mutual interaction between the organism and the environment and the guy was uh, Jakob von Uhek school. Uh, Jakob von Uhek school was uh, an Estonian biologist, do you know him? Have you ever heard of him before? No? Yeah, I do. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the, the guy suffered a lot of stigmatization, uh, I mean, also for uh, good reasons. I mean, uh, compared to Christian von Ehrenfels, uh, who was a very strong advocate of eugenetics and uh, uh, anti-Semitism, Jakob von Uhek school uh, uh, make uh, makes uh, von Ehrenfels look like, a, look like a boy scout and uh, he had very strong political opinions, uh, radical political right-wing opinions, and, uh, but this wasn't uh, the uh, worst scene uh, for the scientific community. The fact uh, is that uh, Jakob von Hoekskull considered Darwin uh, stupid because he believed that uh, the evolution by natural selection just couldn't work. Uh, this uh, uh, is a, a very big mistake, of course, but at the same time, uh, it's not enough to say that Yellow Foreman School didn't contribute in a very deep way to the study of biology. He, one of his most important works, the Theoretiska Biologie, uh, is, uh, sh uh, should uh, be read, read by everybody uh, because of the musical metaphors that uh, he tries uh, to, uh, to apply in order to make sense of the interaction between organisms and uh, their environment. Uh, this uh, is considered uh, a book, a very important book in order also for that uh, uh, field of study known as biosemiotics, the study of uh, how animals create meaning through the use, through communication and the use of signs, quote unquote, is a very broad sense. Uh, and there is another book that has been translated in Italian, uh, and I guess uh, that the Theoretic Bibliology has, uh, hasn't been translated yet, but uh, there is another book, uh, a lesser book, uh, but so important in this respect, that is uh, uh, Human and Animal Environment. Actually, the original title is uh, A Walk Through Natural, Through to Animal and Human Environment. Uh, and uh, in the translation is uh, for quality that in Italy, uh, Ambiente Umani and Umani. Why this book is so important? Because this is the book where uh, from the school introduces the concept of Umwelt, uh, the word for itself, uh, itself uh, to be meant as the organism. Uh, what is the Umwelt? Is the way by which um, duality between organism and the environment can be accomplished and that uh, it is determined by the structures uh, provided by a species-specific physiology of an organism. This is something that enables a functional circle between a perceptual organ and a factual organ, so sensory on one hand and motor dimension on the other one, and uh, this functional circle is what allows every single organism to live in the same environment, experiencing a different environment. Let's think about uh, this uh, room. Okay, Florence is quite cold, but uh, I guess it will work the same. I'm quite sure that how many species do we have in this room? I, I guess uh, a couple of hundreds. Uh, bacteria, insects, uh, somebody that we cannot see or hear nor hear in the wall. We are sharing the same physical environment, not a single organism is living the same umbelt. Okay, this, this is something that uh, just like uh, uh, Nagel's work, how does it feel to be a bat? I don't know how can it feel because I don't have the radar, the echolocator sensory organ, therefore I cannot have the same experience of such an umwelt. Why this is so important? Because uh, umwelt is uh, nothing more than what Gibson tries to explain to us in this book when he says that the environment is made up of information, of meaningful information. This is something that is 
very important. Please remember this 1979, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that Tolman and Howell have uh, uh, built the uh, most important strikes against behaviorism just uh, a couple of decades before, uh, the idea of speaking again into cognitive psychology of meaning, uh, it, wa it, it wasn't like speaking about motivations or representation, mental representation, it's more like meaning, something very philosophical. And uh, he, the, the, there is bravery in Ibsen when he says the world of physical reality does not consist of meaningful things, but the world of ecological reality does. This is important because meanings can be discovered, and this means that there has to be an active role, not of the organism necessarily, but of the mutuality between the organism and the environment. And uh, this uh, meaning, according to uh, Gibson, is uh, provided by the kind of information that is present in the environment. Now, this uh, is uh, what, uh, uh, let me make a little spoiler about this, this is exactly where I start thinking that we have to uh, criticize some of, the, uh, of Gibson's uh, theory in respect to the environment. Why? Because if you take a look, and probably you have done this by reading the excerpts, uh, you have seen that uh, uh, Gibson uh, refuses uh, to uh, consider information anything but the physical information. He spends a lot of time by saying no, the world of the physic the world of physics is not the world of psychology, but at the same time, if you take a look at what kind of information, what kind of uh, informational features are relevant in his uh, 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 in his thought, it's all about surfaces, it's all about dimension, it's all about shape, it's all about color, therefore so just physical features. And this uh, is, uh, notwithstanding uh, any possible criticism, enough, uh, sufficient for establishing the most important part of this theory, the theory of affordances. What are the affordances? These are uh, what uh, the environment offers to the animal, providing uh, some possibilities of action. Again, let me get back to this, uh, to this example. If I have a pen and I have a buckle, and I don't, it's not important if I have already in the past uh, seen or um, uh, met this pen or this buckle, I can also completely be ignorant in respect to what a pen is or what a buckle is but I immediately know, in a very innate way, that in order to grasp this pen, I have to employ a fine grasp, and on the other hand, in order to take the bottle, I have to do a strong grasp. I cannot, I mean, I can do this, I can try to take a bottle with uh, two fingers, but the result will be just that it's very inconvenient and I will look down. At the same time, the fact that I cannot take a pen with my fine grasp, what it usually means in psychology and in neurology, that I have not developed a new schema in the Piaget's development of cognitive functions. So this is something that makes sense if you, if you take it from a broader perspective. Uh, affordances uh, are uh, very peculiar in their quality. This is something that has to be underlined because uh, uh, he, what Gibson says is that uh, affordances are not something that relates uh, to the object, neither to the subject. It's something that just cuts across the dichotomy of subjective and objective experience. And uh, it shows all the inadequacy. This is the reason why we consider Gibson as the father of an activism. And uh, uh, I want uh, just, just because I'm so uh, glad and uh, honored to have uh, such a, 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 a gathering of uh, historians of science, uh, it is easy for contemporary psychologists to say, oh, you mean, I know Gibson, the father of an activism. When Gibson was writing his words, he, he was just uh, respecting and honoring what Holt and Lenfield left him. You can easily see how much this is a radical empiricism, no, no matter that what I have in my brain, what I have in my mind is exactly a reflection of what is around and uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, 
something is in the environment because I can see that affordance is, and operationalist principles. No need for postulating anything but the mere set of processes. Okay? This is perfectly fine and in line with what we have seen. Uh, I, 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 I run at Timo Maxim, just uh, punch me if, if you need. Uh, there is something more that I want to keep in mind, uh, that I want you to, to keep in mind because uh, I think it's uh, paramount. Uh, the role of uh, some uh, uh, factors that can influence the way by which we see and perceive affordances in the world. The first uh, factor is the, the role played by nesting. This one underlines for a lot of pages that uh, perceptual objects are nested in the environment and this is important also because it, uh, some, it is something that can explain the wide complexity of our perception. It uh, makes uh, an extreme difference if I see uh, this, this building uh, from the outside, so taking the macro level of analysis, uh, these, that perception will provide me specific affordances. Then I enter the room, then I sit on this chair, and every time I move into le another level of nesting, I can have other affordances and I can have uh, other possibilities. It, this is just because my sensory uh, if a motor uh, physiology, my sensory motor structures allow me to afford the different things at different levels. Uh, and there is also the time scale, of course. Uh, there should be something to be said about events, but I'm afraid I don't have the time to so. But uh, what is the pilot? I always remember that uh, uh, Gibson is very aware of the role played by permanence and change in the environment. And uh, I just want to uh, add something more. He is aware of the role of the, temp the time scale in the environment. It looks like uh, he is ignoring uh, the uh, permanence and change in the organism. But uh, I mean, probably it's, uh, it wasn't uh, even uh, the, uh, the scope of the book. Something more interesting that uh, connects uh, uh, Gibson's legacy also to the other E of the 4E framework, 4E's framework, is a uh, uh, reflection about the tools, boundaries, and niches. Uh, there is an amazing paragraph that I have underlined in the excerpt when, uh, where Gibson says uh, the capacity to attach something to the body suggests that the boundary between the animal and the environment is not fixed at the surface of the skin, but can shift. More generally, it suggests that the absolute duality of objective and subjective is false. So there is another epistemic strong claim that we cannot divide the subject from the environment, not even for theoretical reasons, and at the same time, Gibson already uh, foresees the need for taking into account our ability to extend the, that function, functional circle in a form of excursor that allows us to perceive affordances in the environment. And uh, this is something that is important for my research. Uh, he also considers the role played by niche construction and, more precisely, by human niche construction. He keeps into account the fact that we are able to produce artifacts, to produce, we are able to reshape the environment around us, and what is the, uh, the goal of all this? To change what uh, the environment affords the human beings. So this is something that is extremely important because in my research this uh, has uh, represented the turning point uh, in avoiding any difference between natural environment and digital environments from a psychological perspective. No matter if uh, the environment we are talking about is completely artificial. As he says, it is also a mistake to separate the cultural environment from the natural environment. So, an environment that is completely made up of information, even artificial cultural information, still is an environment with its own affordances and its own set of possibilities. Uh, please notice that uh, he also uh, includes uh, 
behavior. He, he, he talks about uh, uh, sexual behaviors, predatory behaviors, nurturing behaviors, communication too. So this is uh, important to me. And uh, let me uh, spend uh, 30 seconds uh, and, uh, uh, of my time and your life, sorry again, uh, in order to uh, explain to you what I have inferred from the, what I have inferred from these. I personally think that uh, yes, uh, Gibson uh, is, uh, was true in, uh, and uh, right in defining environment as the set of information, meaning affordances that it provides to an organism, I think that we should make another distinction that is more uh, true to the legacy of Heider that uh, I guess you have recognized in, in uh, Gibson's words. Uh, the information in uh, the environment uh, should be divided into two kinds. So we have affordances, yes, but we have also constraints. So what is the difference? Affordances represent uh, exploitable information, information that uh, an organism is able to perceive and to make sense of. On the other hand, we have constraints that is non-exploitable information, meaning that the organism is not able to perceive it because it lacks the sensory organ for doing so, or is unable to make sense of it. This is a, a major point and I will, uh, I will explain why. It is true that, uh, uh, just, to, just to make this uh, more uh, uh, faithful in respect to reality, elements in the environment always feature both affordances and constraints. I mean, I, uh, I, there are some affordances that are negative affordances. I know, for example, that I cannot chew this butter, or maybe I can do this, but it will be a sort of bloodbath in my mouth. Uh, and uh, this uh, is something that changes with the level of nesting that I am referring to. It changes with the temporal permanence of change, uh, but uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, the fact that we can use uh, what uh, is common, uh, is shared, uh, by both von Wexpol and Gibson in respect to the mutuality of organism environment is not just the species specific physiology that allows an organism to notice specific affordances. For example, <coughs> let me explain this uh, by trying to highlight the influence of Kafka on, on, uh, on Gibson. Gibson is very clear any similarity or analogy with uh, the environment as uh, he defines it in the, in the 1979 book and Kafka, and Kafka's behavioral environment. He wrote this very clearly. The niche for a certain species should not be confused with what some animal psychologists these for historical psychology, this is important because uh, Gestaltists were usually accused of being a comparative psychologist and that's all because of Kohler and the, the study of uh, primates. Uh, but you want, you want to say, no, there is no place for phenomenality. But uh, if you take a look at one of the most important books in Gestalt theory, that is the principles of Gestalt psychology, like Kafka 1935, you will, uh, uh, you will just stumble in the Costanza Lake tale, no? the story of this rider that arrived in front of a tavern, and uh, the, 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 the tavern keeper says, uh, well, wh where did you come from? And he says, from that point, and uh, the, the innkeeper says, you, you, you just pass through the lake of Costanza, the Costanza Lake, and the rider ha has a stroke and dies. And this is exactly the, the anecdote that Kafka uses in order to say, this was a physical environment, the Costanza Lake, but the rider didn't know, didn't know about it. And therefore he perceived that it was a plain, even if covered of snow, is a plain land, and they passed through it. This is extremely relevant because phenomenology, phenomenal states, that are completely denied by, by Gibson are extremely important. What about emotional states? Probably you know, those of you who are interested in psycho psychopathology and its history, that uh, people suffering from depression and other form of uh, uh, emotional pain can just miss the affordances in the environment, especially the most complex affordances, like the social one, the communicative one, the behavioral ones. And uh, what about illusions? Something, this is something that is usually attributed as uh, the, main, the, 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 the most important uh, accusation against uh, Gibson theory. And uh, the criticists have a point. 
illusions cannot be explained by direct perception. Why do I, why I can be, this is the touch of illusion, it's, it's, it works with any illusion of course, this is just a, uh, an image that I love, the touch of illusion is amazing, it's a little creepy but, but at least. So, summarizing and again apologizing for the time uh, I, I took, what is life, what is that in uh, Gibson's theory? Uh, we know that uh, organism and viral punctuality has been confirmed uh, in uh, our contemporary framework and probably we cannot just uh, ignore the high value of uh, an activity and an activism in Gibson's words. The whole theory of affordances have been confirmed, even neuroscience. I don't want to bore you with the technical details, but uh, if you think about the most important discovery in neuroscience of the recent years, the discovery of mirror neuron system by Rizzolatti and the Parma group, what is our ability to simulate, to mirror the physical, behavioral, cognitive state of the other, just taking a look at them? This is nothing more than affordances 2.0, the upgraded version, with a very sound proof in uh, the brain, in the nervous system. Psychological niche construction theory, but I promise I won't, uh, I won't uh, go the, I, I, I won't uh, open a digression about it, and extension model, think about the tools. What is that? What is uh, nowadays uh, unbearable as a theoretical position? The rejection of phenomenology. We cannot reject phenomenal states because we know that phenomenal states can completely change the affordances that we perceive in the environment and that in my personal opinion I also think that the exclusive focus on the animal world is something that is, uh, I mean, a little rigid, a little too much strict because uh, uh, ex excluding uh, completely plants and uh, other organisms from uh, this kind of interaction just doesn't make sense. Uh, we live in a systemic world, uh, we live, uh, in, a, we, we live in, a, in a time of the history of science when we have adopted the... Oh, I'm so clumsy, sorry about this. Uh, uh, we live in a world when we have this uh, uh, very strong uh, taste and fondness for systemic perception because it's a way of embracing the complexity of cognition too. And I personally think that we should, uh, we should uh, ask uh, uh, we should apologize with plants uh, for having uh, just uh, left them out of this, uh, of this discourse. What is in a Schrodinger's cat state is direct perception. Uh, not because it's dead, not because it's alive, but because I think that uh, in uh, several ways, maybe if you want, I will get back to Florence uh, one other day and I will uh, tell you about the reasons uh, from uh, my own perspective for asking for an integration between direct perception and Gregorian uh, uh, models of perception. Uh, this is something that has to do exactly with illusions, but uh, Maxime already made me uh, the sign and therefore thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. <laughs>